Welcome to EB-5 Investment Voice, where attorney insights intersects with immigration investments. If you are a foreign investor, domestic fund manager, or enterprising entrepreneur and want to get the most out of the EB-5 program, you have come to the right place. I'm Mark Deal, and I'll be your co-host on this journey. I'm joined by your host, Mona Shaw, and other attorneys at Mona Shaw & Associates, as well as immigration leaders from around the world. So let's get into EB-5 Investment Voice. So the last couple of episodes, we covered a legal error by USCIS, and then a subsequent update, EB-5 was back in business. Mona, how is the industry going? (laughs) Back in business, (laughs) Mark. Uh, yeah, we are very busy. A lot of people who are who were thinking about coming to the United States, you know, they were just waiting for some kind of guidance or something with all the legislative updates. Of course, as you know, the new law was passed back on March 11th of this year, but then everything was held in abeyance until regional centers were able to be back in action. Now that we're back in business, it's been travel, it's been uh, inquiries. And, you know, what can I say? People are ready to go. So Mona, you're saying people are traveling, people are inquiring, but people are also starting to invest again, right? Like actual money is being transferred? Indeed. I can tell you it's on very, very good authority that the money flow has started again, uh, money flow within uh, projects. And again, from very good authority, it's coming from all kinds of different regions, areas that we had not typically seen EB5 money previously. Yeah, the EB-5 industry, the whole landscape and the demographic has really changed since we've been doing this show for the last six, seven years. Right, Mona? It has. And I think a very typical example is our guest today, Sam Hussein from BLS Media in London, who last came on our show, can you believe it, Mark, four years ago? Yeah, four years, one month. (laughs) (laughs) Sam, welcome back to EB-5 Investment Voice. Oh, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mona. I'm a bit disappointed why I wasn't invited in those four years, but I'm just, I'm just like extremely grateful to be back. And being a subscriber to this podcast, I, I'm just delighted to be here. So, um, Mona, you're right. It's about time. It's a great time now in terms of the EB5 market as well as the CBI space. Right. Well, how long? I know you were dealing with the CBI before you did, dealt with EB5, but how many years has it been for you, Sam? So it's actually our 15th anniversary. Oh, wow. Uh, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think that was one of the reasons why I'm actually on this show. But um, yes, yeah. <laughs> for the 15 years. All right. And, and I know you have been, as I said, dealing with the CBI market, but you are seeing now far more attention coming to the United States, right? <sighs> yes. So let me, for your audience, um, explain to them first exactly our position in the market. You know, sure. BLS okay. Global, we, we kind of see... A, ourselves as market leaders that really focus on a lot of emerging markets. You know, we have our flagship magazine, the CBI, and we've been organizing events where we see a massive appetite for citizenship residency. So we're always, always, always marketing, trying to find out where is the next place where there's going to be a big appetite and an interest for EB5. And um, yes, we Mona, it's just been crazy it's just been absolutely crazy for you uh, i remember we actually met what in 2014 in dubai i believe it was uh, mona time for eyes when you're having fun <laughs> <laughs> and your head office you're based in london yes so our head office is in london we've expanded a lot of our operations we have branches in um you know middle east um india we've expanded you know we've increased a lot of manpower a lot of resources it's just crazy we've just been so busy It's just been Mm. amazing. Well, I'm going to ask you some questions, which I know uh, our audience are really interested. They really want to know what's going on out there because there there has been this hiatus, as you know, here. Kind of a slowdown because of the legislative activity, etc. But at this point, what percentage of investors that you deal with want to come to the US versus other countries? So, Mona, that's a really good question, and it really depends on the market. You know, if you look at, for example, India, you know, the top destination, again, is the US, Canada, UK, Africa is the same, and different markets have a different appetite. You know, you get certain markets that are very keen on um, certain golden visa programs, but again, I would say 
investors are really US, Canada and UK is actually top of the agenda for the investors that are looking for, you know, citizenship or residency programs. Mm. And this is really is becoming big, actually, the residency. It's interesting yeah. how big it is becoming. And I'm going to ask you, are you seeing any flow from the US out as in US citizens going to other countries? Yes, I'm actually seeing a lot of Americans inquiring about the golden visa program, specifically Portugal. And that's quite interesting. Um, you guys as Americans perhaps can give me a bit of light to this. You know, why, why do you, why do Americans? Do <laughs> well, 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 um, the you guys, I might be Mark, but you know, I'm British too. So. <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. I, I know a couple of, in my friend group, I uh, just recently moved to, to Portugal, uh, like two, two sets of families uh, this summer. So it is happening. I've seen it firsthand. I'm, I'm not sure why. Well, Mark, we, we have a guest coming on, as you know, shortly, um, who's going to talk about this in detail. Yeah, I think a lot of the countries have been very creative in their programs. So these nomad visas, you know, working remotely has been very attractive for a lot of investors and entrepreneurs that can work nowadays remotely since COVID. They've been, you know, they can work anywhere where they want. So they're actually choosing wonderful destinations. Yeah, but let me ask you, though, uh, there's been so much which has been happening here. I mean, more has happened in the United States in the last year than it has in the last 20 something years. Did you notice a difference when, for example, the regional center program went into their hiatus? And were you busy with investors wanting direct projects, for example? Yes. What we are finding, obviously, Mona, perhaps you can explain to the audience in terms of since March, you know, there's been changes before. With the direct project, there was a pool of investors that can go into a direct project. Now it's like one investor. And we do get a lot of investors that go think, well, if I'm going to be investing the minimum amount, which is 800000 should I be investing in my own project? That's quite popular to a lot of investors. Well, However, certain countries, I would say. I would say like the entrepreneurial countries who do that, and perhaps India, the Latin American countries. See, Simona, you're just one step ahead of the game. I was just about to mention. <laughs> I, I was just about to mention. These are countries where you can see they're very. They have a business mindset and they're very much entrepreneur orientated. And uh, you know, they're the ones that look at the opportunity of potentially doing a direct project for themselves. However, when you explain to them the criteria and also compare the regional center then I, I, I see them moving towards the regional centre projects. You know, since March uh, and the return of the regional centre projects, I do see that most investors feel a lot more comfortable with regional centres because of all of the new securities laws and all of the new regulations which came under RIA. Well, I think, you know, it was about time there was a lot of changes and a lot of acts were coming in. And this really uh, makes, you know, investors feel much more comfortable and they really understand a bit more on the regional centers. And plus the investors, now that we get inquired from, they're very smart. They really understand much more the whole structure of a regional center project, as well as outflows. So that, that's true. Mona. They're, they're very the education. Budget. The education is definitely different. And of course, you know, we go through so much here before there's changes. I mean, getting this through Congress has taken seven years. It's not like you guys in the UK where yeah. Priti Patel decides she's going to take <laughs> off tier one entrepreneurial visa <laughs> overnight just because she doesn't want the Russians in. <laughs> yeah. No, no. Yeah, we, we, we do make a few um, rush decisions now and then. Um, <laughs> however, you know, we kind of like to make sure we make the right decision. And, you know, with this new legislation and these changes you know people feel comfortable they know it's around for five years it's stable there's not going to be any changes so it's really giving that confidence and that comfort to those investors but sam i know you guys do an awful lot of marketing and then uh, along with the marketing there's this follow-up and and there's uh, there's expenses Whereas everybody in the EB5 world knows that there are commissions which are paid out, the new law is is really honing in on this requirement and, mm-hmm. and making sure that the investor understands about agent registration, etc. I mean, how do you guys feel? Well, Mona, as they say, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And, you know, <laughs> everything, everything costs money. And seriously, people underestimate how much investment we as a company have to make in order to bring that um, investor 
to the table. You know, there's a lot of money that goes online. You know, you're doing podcasts, you're doing a lot of webinars, you know, you're doing a lot of content, you know, the manpower that goes into this, you know, there's a lot of content, it's education, 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 you know, and also some of these investors, you know, you're not just educating them once, you might have to be meeting them four or five times, that's time and resources, there's a lot of cost, and a lot of um, investment that goes in, in getting that investor. So whatever you're paid now, the US government will know and the investor will know. Mona, we welcome this. You know, we've been crying out for this because I think it was about time the investor really knows where their investment is going to, how that money's been allocated from a regional center project, if they're paying any additional fees. It's really important. And we're quite transparent and we really welcome this because, you know, we, we when an investor makes an inquiry, we do explain to them, look, that you've only made that inquiry through our campaign. And that yeah. campaign could be through various resources. And they appreciate that. And once you're transparent with that investor from day one, they you, you build that trust factor. Yeah. No, I do realize there's, I mean, when you go out to these different countries, you need people on the ground and you need people who speak the language. And I know you've been, so you've covered tons of markets. You yes. have been in what, the UAE, the MENA region. Yes. What new countries are you seeing? Or where are you seeing investors coming from? That's what everybody wants to know. Okay. There's no one place anymore, really, is no, there? There isn't. As, as you've said, you know, there's, you know, you've given a bit of an insight to the audience that, you know, there's wire transfers coming from probably un, uncharted territories, which is brilliant for the industry. So again, you know, we're always seeing interest from India. Again, you know, you're, you're not just seeing interest from Indians being in India, but they're being placed in Middle East or Europe, etc. You know, you've always got huge interest from India. You've always got interest from the Middle East. Latin America is the, the inquiries and the wires. It's just phenomenal. So from and Latin then, America, what countries are you seeing are, are Brazil, the most active? Brazil, Peru. Peru. You know, these are countries, yes, Venezuela. You, you know, th- there's a lot of political uncertainties. And, yeah. I, I, and I'm not a, I don't want to get into a political di- discussion. That's a, that's a podcast probably for Mark and you, Mona. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, 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 I'm not going to get into that discussion. But, you know, when there's a lot of political uncertainties and, you know, when there's a potentially a, a recession coming up, then there's a huge spike of interest for the CBI and especially for the EB5 program. Are you still seeing interest from from uh, the Asian countries like China, Korea, Vietnam? Yes, you do. You do. Vietnam, Korea, you know, funny enough, Mona, you know, um, some investors have recently, which I, which, uh, you know, have wired in the last couple of weeks from Korea, you know, it's very dominated by agents. However, a lot of these Koreans that are very well adverse and knowledgeable on, on EB5 are actually doing their own researches. And that's why you've got to, yeah. So you really have to make sure you, you know, we've got a big marketing team. We've got a lot of people on the floor, educating people. So this is, these are huge costs. However, these are a cost that that's needed to bring, you know, to educate those investors. So the, the, you know, people are very, very smart. They've got a lot of resources, you know, they use the tablets, loads of devices. It has changed. I mean, you know, Mark, when we first started going into EB5, it was actually South Korea was the biggest market. Then uh, it was China. And do you remember when we first started this podcast series, it was the, the largest listening uh, segment was actually from China. Oh, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. Then it went from that to, I don't know who our largest listening audience is now. It's all over the place. But. Oh, you mentioned it. I'm going to have to check the stats. But I, I know it does kind of shift around depending on the topic. So when we talk about the Middle East, we do have more people listening in the Middle East. So uh, it, it, somehow it gets discovered when we start talking about a region, uh, that region picks it up. It, the cause effect is also the reverse. When we see more people listening in an area, we're like, oh, we haven't uh, touched on that. I remember during COVID, we had some really strange areas uh, which were dominating our listening patterns, like places where we wouldn't expect it, like Madrid. Mm. Yeah. (laughs) As I'm quiet right now, I'm just letting the listener know that I'm checking the stats. I shouldn't be doing this while we're recording an episode. (laughs) (laughs) 
Sam, I know you, you, you deal with lots of different projects and, you know, investors get confused because so many projects mm-hmm. have, I mean, you, the due diligence on projects is hard at times yeah. because location matters, management matters, but there are investors who are sophisticated people, but perhaps they don't understand a particular industry. How do you tackle that? I mean, how do you tackle which project to represent? So, so that's, that's a very good question. Mona. So like, you know, you obviously want to look at a number of projects in terms of who's done their documentations, looking at their track record. You also want to see, you know, there's a lot of checklists or a lot of questions that an investor should ask on a project. But um, in terms of good projects out there, you know, you're look, really looking at track record, but you're also seeing a lot of new projects that are um, coming up in the market. You know, they're, they're approaching us. But again, I, I kind of leave a lot of that to the experts. We also have an overview. But Mona, let me throw that question back to you. What do you look for in a project? You know, you have so many people approaching you, asking your advice. Well, we, we, we're we kind of limited because as, as lawyers, we're not really supposed to be, we're not financial advisors, mm-hmm. but we are allowed to comment on projects, for example, that we've worked with or where we have some in-depth knowledge and say, for example, we've done project documentation um, when we've done the PPM and those kind of documents, then we have to, by necessity, look into that project and the project, for example, the management very deeply. And I can tell you in my experience, and we've seen this, we've mm-hmm. seen really, really good projects go down because of bad management. And we've seen mediocre projects come up mm-hmm. because of new of good management. Location, location is so important. Mm-hmm. And then the industry itself is not a factor. You know, you probably hear people saying, oh, look, I only want real estate. Well, real estate is huge. And you don't know, you know, hospitality is also real estate. But, you know, is hospitality the same everywhere? No, it's not. And one thing I have really discovered since I would say the golden age of the direct visas is that the investors who come in now are not averse to looking at other industries. They will look at places, uh, industries like like the medical field, veterinarians uh, and, and medical, uh, anything medical, for example, other industries relating, say, maybe to transportation or trucking or culinary. Uh, it's different. I feel like the market has changed. It's swung open since COVID. I don't know if you're seeing the same. I am. And you know what's really interesting? A lot of investors also want to know the management team and their background and their history and the founders as well. So they're really doing, which I would say, enhanced due diligence. You know, it's not just the projects and the documentation, but also the team behind this. Because as you said, you know, there's been really solid projects out there, but they've been um, mis- mishandled. And so they're really looking into uh, and isn't that part of the uh, criteria, Mona, in terms of this new Integrity Act, you know, um, new legislation where th- there's more documentations that yeah. have to be provided by the founders? Yes, that, that's true. And there's more oversight, a lot more oversight. But it, I also think the swing in the market and, and, you know, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but in my opinion, uh, the swing in the market has a lot to do with the increased amount of Indians coming in, because for Indians, generally, their English is good, their comprehension is good. Yeah. And they don't need a second agent to come in. So whereas before, when we were talking about the Chinese market mm. more, they because there was a language barrier, they, the agent did have a way in. And if they got paid a good commission, they really didn't care about due diligence. Yeah, no. So it, as you said, like, you know, certain markets, they speak English very well. You know, South Africa is another market. And, you know, they can go directly to the project or um, the person who's marketing that project so that they ask a lot of questions. And you now you're seeing a lot of people ask much more, more questions geared towards the financial structure of the projects. So it's not so much dominated as with agents as it used to be. Uh, so you're really getting a lot of direct inquiries. And to be honest, Mona, a lot of that happens only if you're doing good marketing. And how many times have I come to you, Mona, in how a project should be marketed? Because sometimes the project could be great, but if it's not marketed correctly, you're just not going to get the audience that you want to, you know, you want to obtain. Well, it's also vice versa. You could have a very mediocre project which is marketed brilliantly. Yes, but we wouldn't market a project that you know there's a few questions that's going to be raised on that project so we only want to work on solid projects so that's why we're very selective on the projects that we have or we market out to the industry well 
What about new developers coming into the market? You know, they, they really don't know even where to start. Do you have any advice for them? Yeah, they should get in touch with you. That's the first thing they should do. <laughs> <laughs> Always solid advice. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, seriously. I mean, do you advise developers to go into a country and set up an office or, or what should a developer do? Okay, so everyone thinks I can just go into that market, present a wonderful brochure and leave a few days later. It doesn't work. You really need to constantly, constantly market to that market and also make sure you're constantly revisiting that market. And ideally, if you have someone that, very solid to represent the brand and the company they should really have someone on the ground level and that's what we do you know whenever we're entering a market Mona as you know there's a lot of new markets we've we've gone into like Turkey we've invested heavily in human resources making sure we have people on the ground speaking to investors because it's great when you're speaking to investors over the phone but when you have that one-to-one contact it makes a big difference you know I think everyone's fed up or get fed up of being zoomed out now they really want to meet people and you know that's key and i really believe new developers need to you know market a lot and you know allocate a lot of marketing dollars to to new markets that's available out there yeah uh interestingly christian nishman just in his he has that wonderful blog brilliant articles and he did an article just recently on on mm-hmm. saying it for him the top two Dubai is still one of the top areas, one of the top hubs. And he brought up Turkey as well as being one of the new markets which is out there. Well, Mona, you know, we at BLS, we've always been innovative in our way of reaching new markets. We always go out to new markets where we see a lot of potential. So we invest a lot. So I'm glad Turkey is a rising star. However, you know, we've been penetrating that market for a while. Same situation with South Africa you know, UAE. So, you know, these are great stats and figures in terms of UAE, um, Canada, UK, you know, UK is also a big market, but we've been in that market, Mona, as well as you, well adverse before these blogs came out. So we, we do our researches, we make sure these markets that are, you know, being highlighted, We've been there. We've been there. You've been hmm. there, Mona, as well. Uh, yeah. Well, I have a question for you. Yes. Um, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of activity from certain countries like yes. uh, like Nigeria, where it yes. may not necessarily be as safe to go in and visit. Mm-hmm. How do you go? Or how do you get on the ground in in countries like that? Okay. So so Nigeria, obviously, as you said, security safety is a big concern. So you can always have meetings in uh, the top five star hotels. If you're marketing correctly to the right audience, you will get inquiries. You should be having meetings prior. And then you, of course, should try to make that attempt to go to the core cities where there's a lot of, you know, closures, a lot of activities happening for the CBI space. So my advice is try to have someone locally based there. And eventually you do need to make that visit. And if they, if you do make that visit, then literally closing should be happening because now the market's opened up. It's really opened up. Sam, I know there's a ton of interest recently and for some time actually with the E2 process. Mm-hmm. Are you seeing E2 taking over from EB5 in some countries? Certain countries, there's always been huge interest for E2. However, when you explain to them the differences between E2 and EB5, the wealthy clients or the ones that have the capital do opt for the EB-5 program. But in terms of E2s, yes, there's a huge interest for E2. But again, they're really looking for a good project. If there's a really good project out there on an E2 project, there should be a lot more activities on E2. And one of my questions to you, Mona, is one of the concerns for a lot of the E2 clients is getting that appointment at the local consulate. And oh, that's which been is, one of the biggest, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's been a nightmare since COVID. I mean, there are back heavy duty backlogs everywhere. So if somebody is coming in because uh, with a need to because they think it's faster, it's actually not at the moment. So are they advised to either apply at the local consulate or should they actually, if they have a valid visa to go to the US and actually make an application in the US? Sorry, I, I, I'm turning this 
wonderful <laughs> podcast. To, to <laughs> well, actually, no, because the E2, if they want to travel, they have to go through the consulate. I mean, even if they come into the US and try and do an adjustment, they can't travel until you go back to the consulate. And we'd have to put the application in a second time to the consulate. Mm. So it really doesn't help at all. Yeah, it doesn't sound like it would. Sam, you did mention Europe before being a market, of course. Are you seeing any changes because of the the whole Ukraine business and, and Russia really being out of the market? Yeah, so actually, Mona, like, you know, there was recent um, statistic article out in terms of how much outbound migrations are happening, especially in Europe and UK being one of the countries with a lot of these political situation that's been taking place in the UK Funny enough, UK, that there's a big appetite for migration. And a lot of UK nationals, I think the third or fourth statistically high net worth individuals that are actually migrating out of the UK. And, and that, that could be either for the Golden Visa program or it could be, you know, for the US program. So us being in the UK, you know, there's tremendous, tremendous amount of inquiries, especially for E2. And, and I really see um, UK really picking up interest in terms of EB5? Well, you know, we've always had uh, interest from from the UK. and uh, But traditionally, obviously, UK has been, is, is a wonderful E2 pro, um, mm-hmm. country. But I would say for some time, we're seeing a lot more interest in EB5, which is which is surprising. Mona, you haven't been in the UK for a while, so I, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Let's throw that it's back not, at me. <laughs> it's not surprising with everything that's going on. So uh, you know, the, the rates have gone up. Um, there's I know you're paying a lot more for petrol than we are. What is it? Twenty, almost twenty dollars a gallon. Yeah, it's almost so twenty dollars a gallon exactly, there. Exactly. Yeah, and the corporation tax has increased. <laughs> Cost of living is just crazy. So these are tick boxes in terms of you know for residency and citizenship so yes it's one of those countries all i can say is watch this space that's all i can say well sam last we had you on a little over four years ago you were talking about the global investment immigration summit that was 2018 Uh, that one was based in london i know you're doing it again this year in 2022 this time in istanbul turkey can you tell us a little bit more about it well mark you know, this will be our second event in Istanbul. We've decided to, to you know revisit Istanbul because we see this as a vibrant market for the residency and the citizenship industry. What we've done, Mark, now is we are actually being very, very selective on who participates in the event because we really want a really presentable presentations to the audience because we're really investing heavily in making sure we bring the right investors to these events. So we really have limited opportunities available for a lot of sponsors for these events. They're a bit more smaller. They're a bit more niche. However, they're quality. So when we have people like Mona on a panel or other regional centers, you know, the audience really appreciate that because they're actually hearing from industry leaders and experts and that's our focus and yes we are, and i'm pleased to say you know the next event that we have taking place is actually going to be in istanbul and it's actually on the 24th of september so mona i hope um you know you, you book your flights <laughs> and uh, you, you know they, 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 they just want you back mona they just like you know you're gonna have my back <laughs> uh, sam let me ask you a follow-up question what kinds of things can people expect to to learn and gain from these events when you're educating an investor on, on the various different investment immigration programs they actually want to hear directly from an attorney how their process will be processed where can we potentially meet the owners of, say, for example, the regional center where we're going to be wiring this amount of money? So they really want to meet their actual project sponsors or they really actually want to meet the attorneys because they can have that one-to-one consultation. Because when we do these events, Mark, it's not just an event for that day. It's actually the build-up towards the event and actual follow-ups. And that's what we do, Mona. As, as you know, and as you, Mark, we do is we follow up. We want to make sure that they've been able to digest information if there's any information that's missing. And then we make sure that the partner, the sponsor that's actually 
giving them that information gets to reset and explain and make them understand the whole CBI program, which they decide to do. Mm, Sam, are you seeing a difference though with in type of uh, investor because the amount minimum amount is eight hundred thousand now, and of course by the time all the costs and the admin fees and everything else there, we're talking about closer to nine hundred thousand. I mean, compared to that to the five hundred thousand previously, it, it's a big mm-hmm. difference. Yes, you, you are you are definitely seeing there's a different quality of investors, and a lot of them will have a lot of entrepreneur business background, and they've, they've obviously in good positions or they've you know they've done really well for themselves so i i really welcome these investors that are coming out the 800 because they ask really smart questions they're not such a big challenge you know that they really are solid investors that you know they know what investment amounts need, is needed they also have a lot of clear directions in terms of source of funds so yes you're getting there's less however there's more quality in terms of investor inquiries. You know, Sam, I, I know you're sore about it being four years since you were last on, but let me ask you, a lot has happened in this last four years. We talked about the change in the market and, the, of course, the change in legislation. Where do you see everything going in the next four years? Well, Mona, in that four years, I would have had my I-526 petition. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Mark, I want to be invited. I see this podcast. <laughs> okay, I promise. <laughs> you give me back. <laughs> Sam's smart because he's like, look, Mona, if I give you a really good answer, you'll have me back on for another four years. So he's going to sandbag here. <laughs> <laughs> so I look forward to being invited very soon, Mona. Well, actually, I will, because I haven't asked you about the Afghan market and other, some, there's some specific markets where there's been a ton of activity. And there isn't really time today, but we will bring you back on to help us in, and discover not only new markets, but really go in depth in some of these unusual markets. Mm-hmm. Yeah, these mm-hmm. niche markets. You know, I don't, I don't want to talk about everything in, in, in one podcast. And we want our, <laughs> See? We, exactly, we, want, <laughs> yeah. we, we want our viewers and listeners to join the next podcast. And there's a lot of um, exciting news that are going to be put forward on the next podcast. And, and that's not yeah. Uh, yeah, you know what? That sounds fair. And I know the person listening probably understands, you know, the last couple of minutes were like, hey Sam, what do you expect to happen in the next four years? The best thing to do is is to have him back on and to explore all these topics in greater depth over the next four years. <laughs> not in the next four years. So that's great. Well, Sam Hussein, thank you for coming back on EB5 Investment Voice. Thank you so much, Mark and Mona. And I'm not going to be back in four years. I want it to be within the next three months. (laughs) Thank you for being with us today on EB5 Investment Voice. The topics presented in this podcast is informational in nature and is not to be taken as specific legal advice. If you have questions on the topics presented in this episode or other investment immigration needs, please contact Mona Shaw and Associates. Mona and her attorney staff can be reached at mshawlaw.com. That's M-S-H-A-H-Law.com. Make sure you don't miss our next episode focusing on a different aspect of the EB-5 program by subscribing to the podcast. While you're at it, leave us a rating on iTunes. If you really found this episode valuable, share it with someone else that could benefit from this information. Until then, I'll see you on the next episode of EB-5 Investment Voice.